when uh, I moved from environment to SIB, and my colleague who came from BC came and joined me, we realized that uh, for forest management planning, there's no tool or procedure for assessing conditions in the watershed before the plan is implemented. So we decided that we should put together such a procedure. Um, and there are three things we wanted to achieve. The procedure should be very simple. It should not uh, complicate an already complicated process, which is forest planning. It should comply with the fiscal principles that guide watershed processes. And thirdly, it should, the, the input data should be drivable from existing ESRD databases. So we should not have to run around looking for data to, to implement uh, the procedure. So we, um, to develop such a, a procedure, you have to start from those processes themselves if you do not want it to, to validate those processes. So that's where we started. But uh, i just give you, uh, first of all, what the basis of, of forest planning is in, in this province, the legislative basis, and the, guide, the, the standards and guidelines for that, why we need the assessment procedure, and uh, response of watersheds to disturbance. So those principles that I've, I talked about, how do they change as you disturb or you take activities, the use activities take place in the watershed? And then I'll give you a, a very brief points about the assessment procedure and uh, some results of a case study we carried out, and then conclusions. Now, forest planning is based on, is guided by a number of standards. Uh, we have the Alberta Forest Planning Standard, which, ha which is based on the Canadian Standard Association document uh, Z809. If you are interested in looking at that, I, I can make that available to you. There are also operating ground rules that companies develop as part of their planning process. So the ground rules uh, describe where their roads are going to be, what the size of their cut blocks are going to be, where they're going to be located in the watershed, and so on. Okay, and we have the, the mountain pine beetle action plan. When a company is developing their forest management plan, they have to uh, make reference to this plan if the beetle already exists in their forest management units, how this plan is going to help to manage the beetle. And there is the uh, first nation consultation, which is part of the planning process. Now, the, these guidelines are what we use uh, on the, uh, for each forest management plan, but each of these plans is to be guided by the overarching land use framework. Uh, to also to link with Water for Life, the, the three goals of Water for Life. But why do we need a uh, uh, forest watershed assessment? As I said, it is a requirement under uh, the forest planning standards. It is also required under the Eastern Slopes um, policy. Under the land use framework, watershed, watershed uh, cumulative as, uh, effects in watersheds will have to be managed. That is a requirement under the land use framework. And uh, for forest planning, we, call, we, we develop what we call forest condition assessments to, uh, to address those cumulative effects. Watershed assessments are just a part of the forest condition assessments. We have others which assess habitat, wildfire, historical and projected wildfires, and many others. Uh, this presentation is just talking about only watershed assessments, not talking about other uh, forest condition assessments. However, there are uh, recent challenges in, on the landscape that also needs to be addressed. So uh, for land use activities on the landscape, 
because these challenges exist, we need to carry out some assessment before we actually do the, uh, the land use activity so that we know what condition we are now, what to expect once that activity is completed, and how to manage the watersheds so that the, va the values will remain useful to us. Now I'm diving into development of the tool. So to do this, uh, imagine yourself standing anywhere in any watershed. That yellow box there is where you are standing. Around you are a number of watershed processes taking place. There's precipitation, some of it is cut in the vegetation canopy. Some of it falls as through fall to the ground. Part of that ends up as runoff. Some of it goes into infiltration. Part of the infiltration goes as subsurface flow back into runoff. And the rest goes into groundwater recharge. What is caught in the canopy is not everything that goes as through fall. Some is left, is lost in, back into the atmosphere. Depending on the nature of transport, uh, the precipitation, if it's snow, it's by sublimation. If it's rain, it's, a, it's, it's evapotranspiration. Now, the way trees influence all these uh, processes is that they, they help in that interception, but they also suck up water from the ground for photosynthesis. Not all the water they suck is used for photosynthesis. There's some left that is transport, transpired back into the atmosphere. So the, the component of all this water balance that is influenced by the trees is the evapotranspiration. And it happens that uh, on certain landscapes is the biggest component of all the processes. So when you cut a tree, you change the water balance completely. This is to give you a, another perspective of the same process. The, the green bars are harvest at certain times in the planning horizon. So when you harvest, the blue line is just called a runoff. It's here called water yield. Um, water yield is basically runoff at the, at the outlet of the watershed. So when you harvest, the runoff increases. The next five years you harvest, if that runoff has not recovered to the pre-harvest stage, it increases further. And to the last harvest, then after that, runoff recovers until it's back to the pre-disturbance condition. So we want to be able to capture these changes in our procedure. So basically the responses are that a watershed responds to uh, how much of the watershed you disturb, and literature has shown that if you disturb a watershed and it's less than 20% of that watershed that is disturbed, there's no change in, that, uh, in, the, in, in the response. But 20% or more, then you begin to have significant change. Also, literature has told us that there are tr other thresholds within which if you disturb, the watershed can actually recover with time back to what it was before you carried out the disturbance. Beyond those thresholds, then you have changed the trajectory of the watershed. Let me uh, say that without any type of disturbance, if man does not enter a watershed at all, there is still a, a natural change in every watershed. If you enter a watershed now, after 20 years, go back to the same watershed, it's not going to be the same. The hydrology is also changing. So natural processes take place, natural changes take place. But those changes I'm talking of are those due to man. That's what I've just said. All watersheds recover over some time after the, the disturbance, as long as the disturbance is within the thresholds. And for us, the, the component of the water balance we are focusing on is the evapotranspiration because we are working with trees. And for landscapes of that type, evapotranspiration is the most important that is changed when trees are cut. We are also assuming that we, for each of our watershed, we have average conditions. So when there is a one in 100 year flood, everything is a wat in the watershed is overwhelmed anyway. So it doesn't really matter whether you clear the whole watershed or not, there's going to be some change. Or if there's a drought, it doesn't really matter. 
So we are, this procedure we're developing is based on average conditions. So this uh, schematic is just to give you the, the steps involved. Okay, so we have, uh, we start, start by gathering data. We determine watershed boundaries. So what are we calling watersheds? Is it the small creek just in my backyard, which you are calling a watershed? Or is it the whole of the North Saskatchewan River? We decided to do the assessment at two levels. At the level one, we just carry out a qualitative assessment. This is because there are certain watersheds that are not going to be disturbed at all during the period of the plan. So we, want, we carry out a, an assessment, a qualitative assessment, to see whether there is going to be any impact during that period. If that shows, if it triggers potential for impact, based on the qualitative assessment, then we go on to level two, where we carry out a quantitative assessment. And uh, what I'm presenting is just that quantitative assessment, what metrics we use for that. So information gathering. We are looking for uh, what watershed values are important to protect. There are such things like drinking water, fisheries, uh, wildlife, habitat, uh, wildlife habitat, recreational activities in the watershed, and social, cultural, and aesthetic values. We need to protect all these in our watersheds. Uh, but there are also some hazards that we have to be aware of. Okay? Uh, are there any existing impairments in our watersheds that we should be aware of before the company goes in? Are there any land management issues that we should be aware of before the company goes in? And as I mentioned earlier, is the beetle existing in the watershed or any previous wildfire history in the watershed? We, have to, we take all that into consideration. We also consider the watershed characters. Not all watersheds are the same. Even when they are adjacent, the geology is different, the physiography is different, everything of the watershed is unique. So we have to take the characteristics of the watershed into consideration. We, we then carry out uh, delineations to identify what watersheds within the FMA, the forest management unit, that we are going to consider. Certain disturbance thresholds. As I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. um, literature has shown that if you don't disturb your watershed beyond 20%, you have no issues. So what thresholds are we going to set as far as this assessment procedure is concerned. To do this, we decided to dig into the literature and we found a publication by uh, some researchers in Quebec. What they did is look at over 100 watershed studies in several geoclimatic regions of the world. And they compiled all this into a publication. So we took the publication and developed a chart. And that is what we use to develop, to, uh, to set our disturbance thresholds. And that is a publication there. If anyone is interested, I can send them a copy. So beyond, say, 30%, at least 30% is, is disturbed. So we say that if 30% is disturbed, then you're going to have problems. 40% 40 and 50% are peak flows that have been published to cause uh, changes in the geomorphology of channels and changes in the aquatic environment. So we use these as our disturbance thresholds and how we determined them was this. We took that publication, um, pulled all that data together and came out of this chart. So the, the vertical lines, the, the two vertical lines there indicate our thresholds. So based on this, we defined three levels of risk. So determine, it depends on what the threshold is, the risk is either low, medium, or high. So if it's less than 30%, uh, the hazard that we, we compute, if it's less than 30%, then the risk is low. If it's between 30 and 50%, it's medium. And beyond 50%, we have issues. But how do we deal with those? Well, I'll just explain uh, how those are calculated before I, I show you what we do. Watershed disturbance for forestry, apart from cutting trees, also involves road layouts. 
road layout affects those processes I described, but in different ways. So we, in developing this procedure, we considered how much of the watershed is actually cut, which is called the equivalent clear cut area. And we also looked at the road density. This uh, presentation is just based on the equivalent clear cut area. But for our procedure, we consider the two metrics. The equivalent clear cut area is just a surrogate to measure disturbance. Okay, so we have a four before disturbance, before harvest, that value is zero. At the time of the harvest, then we assume that it's 100%. It also um, shows a change in runoff. The equivalent clear cut area is a surrogate, it's also a surrogate for um, evaporative transpiration because the canopy is removed. So once we are, are, uh, determine what the equivalent clear cut area is, the change in that is a measure of how much peak flow will change. So to carry out the calculations, as I said, we, we wanted to uh, derive, to, to use uh, input data derived from existing databases. So the, the script that was used to de develop for the calculations uh, is based on the Python pr programming method. Um, uh, anybody interested, we can make that available to them. And um, having delineated your watersheds, you know what the polygons is, what the individual characteristics is, what the disturbance history is. We input all that into the Python program and calculate our ECA values. Here, yeah, I'm just showing you what ECA actually is. Um, so for instance, uh, suppose that for this watershed, only 50% of it is harvested. So we, see, we say that the ECA is 0 0.5. And then 25, uh, say 25 years after that, some of that watershed is recovered. Suppose that 50% is recovered then the ECA reduces to 0.25, just about half of that. And say year 60, suppose year 60 is the full recovery. This is not necessarily the case for all stand times. For instance, Aspen recovers after 20 years, no problem. No matter how much you cut. Uh, uh, other stand types recover at longer, uh, during longer periods. But we're just using these time steps to demonstrate how the calculation is done. So the next stage is right here. So once we have got our ECM values calculated, we have our, our rates identified. So for each watershed, we know whether what the ECM value is less than 30%, then it's within the low risk range. Is it between 30 and 50%? Then it's medium. If it's greater than 50%, it's high. So what do we do? We present all that information. This map is a delineation of all the watersheds in this case study. So for each watershed, we calculated that metric. And we display our results as shown here. So along with this map, we make recommendations to our planners, our managers, and the company involved. So how do we deal with this? We call them. Uh, risk mit mitigation strategies. For instance, one way to deal with it is to revise the harvest plan. That is, move harvest blocks around in the watershed so that you minimize the impact, or reduce the size of harvest blocks, or stretch your harvesting over a longer period. All these are strategies to reduce that easier value. Relocate your roads, okay? And that is defined in the uh, operating ground rules. You will time your harvesting for frozen conditions, for instance. If you harvest during frozen conditions, the disturbance is less than during spring or summer. And one important consideration we always make is that we will monitor the watersheds after harvest till full recovery. And that is done under uh, what they call from the Forest Operation Management Program. Every company has to do that. And uh, we expect that they should have a plan to restore 
any conditions that um, stream banks that have failed, uh, riparian vegetation, and so on. That, uh, the, the riparian strategy is defined in the operating ground rules. So this should be very clear in the harvest plan. How, uh, where are they locating stream crossings? The road layout will identify these. So these are some of the conditions, uh, some of the strategies you will use to minimize those impacts. There are other measures that uh, the company can discuss with our managers. Um, for instance, if you have to reduce or stretch out your harvest plan, it has to be approved by the government because of sustainability issues and, and so on. So for this particular case study, implementing those strategies, these are the two uh, water shares that remain as high impact water shares. Every other one is of low impact or medium impact. We can live with the medium impact water shares as long as we have that, uh, those mitigation strategies that go along with our harvest operations. Just a comment on these two water shares. One thing we realized in developing those tools is that boundary water shares tend to be unique in the sense that for these two, this particular water share, only 1% of the entire water share is within this FMA. So what we do is that we flood this one, and when this company is developing the forest management plan, then we consider this along with the rest of the watershed here. And similarly this. Most of the time, these uh, boundary water shares tend to be issues, but that is how we deal with these. So with this, we, we know that as they go in there, if they are following what uh, we have outlined, we are not going to have any issues. Or we have minimum issues. So this is just an outline of the procedure. There's a lot more to it. And um, I can discuss what what um, what the rest of it is with anybody who is, who is interested. Um, by towards the end of the month, there's going to be a workshop in, in Leverage uh, on the net map procedure, which is feeding into this this uh, watershed assessment procedure. And uh, I I think attendance is by invitation. I'm not sure, but you can discuss. Uh, if anybody's interested, just let me know, and I'll put you in contact with who is organizing it. The procedure of develop is simple but reliable. It's, it's simple in the sense that the calculations are not onerous. You don't have to run a very complicated model to calculate those ECA values. The road density values are even much simpler. We have uh, you know, algorithms for doing that. They are all part of the pattern program. So all we do is that we input a special harvest sequence in it. We input a recovery curves. The recovery curves track the recovery of the watershed through time. So we input all that into the Python program and we calculate our metrics. So it's very simple. It's cost effective in the sense that we don't have to spend extra money to, to do it because all the data is derived from the databases. It's flexible enough because uh, we can always uh, make adjustments or recommend adjustments in the forest plan and uh, it's, it's a living document in the sense that uh, we are continuing to update it. The net map that is being developed is going to be to feed into this process. And as we get new knowledge, we improve on it. When there's better understanding, if better recovery cards are developed, we, we put them back into the, the, the template and, and, and run it. And we expect that companies will develop the operating ground rules, and that will be Will, will be part of the uh, operation throughout the period of, um, of their plan. So it's, uh, it's very simple and we have, we have applied it to a number of uh, forest management plans. Results have been, have been uh, satisfactory and um, we continue to improve on it. Monitoring, as I said, is an important part of it. The forest operation management uh, monitoring program uh, is uh, companies work with governments to implement it. So, uh, depend on the monitoring frequency that is identified in the plan. We go out in the fields with the, with, with, with the company to monitor the, the particular variables that we are interested in.